This is the Berman Method podcast featuring Dr. Jake Berman and physician assistant Jenny Berman. We are here to treat problems and not symptoms. Disclaimer, this podcast is for entertainment purposes only and not to treat anyone or to give medical advice. If you are interested in any information that we are giving and would like to use this for yourself, we recommend that you contact your primary care physician or reach out to us and ask us questions about yourself specifically. Enjoy. And we're rolling, baby. Yes, I said baby. And I'm talking a little bit too loud. So I might wake the baby that mommy is holding right now. A sleeping baby that he might wake up currently. The Berman Method Podcast, where we're focused on treating problems and not symptoms while trying to not wake a sleeping baby. Precious, so precious. We're back together again. We're back together again, and we've got somebody that's hanging on, right? Hanging out, hanging on. Or in your kangaroo pouch. Yeah, she's in my pouch. (laughs) She's in my pouch just sleeping. Yep. Hanging out. Vera K is snug as a bug in a kangaroo pouch rug. Yes. So baby girl is here. I'm sure everybody already knows that by now. If you've been following us, you saw that we had a baby girl just a couple weeks ago now. So Vera K came on February 18th, 726 in the morning. Fast. She came fast. <laughs> 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 but um, <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. made her arrival real quick. Why is that funny? <laughs> I know there's at least a small percentage of the population listening to this that knows what I'm laughing about. But anyways, if anybody's concerned, I'm rolling my eyes right now. February 28th was a Saturday. So this baby interrupted. No, February 18th was a Saturday. Yeah, February 18th. What did I say? February 28th. That was the day she was supposed to arrive. Oh, yes. So she came on February 18th. Yes. And it was a Saturday and she interrupted one of our boating days. Correct. It's like, what the heck are you thinking, baby? Yes. But ironically enough, we were out on Friday night for a sunset cruise on the boat. And Jenny was withholding information from me. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> what kind of information? You were having contractions on the boat. <laughs> During our sunset cruise. During our sunset cruise. So we're just sitting out in Little Marco River, watching this beautiful sunset, just hanging out, relaxing, enjoying time. And then we were on the boat ride back and we get back to the dock and she goes, I think I should start timing these things. <laughs> and I said, timing what things? And she goes, M- these contraction things, it kind of feel like contractions now. I'm like, are you serious? We had already ordered to go from Micklebobs, and we had the whole Friday planned out. We did. So she starts timing them, and we eat dinner, and she doesn't really make a big deal about it, so I don't think it's much. And this is how she blows it off. She goes, you know, you can have these things for two weeks, so I'm sure it's no big deal. <laughs> They weren't painful, is what I kept telling you. I could feel them, but they weren't painful, but they were consistent. Yeah. And we were scheduled for a C-section on February 28th, which was 10 days later, mm-hmm. roughly. Mm-hmm. So anyways, we go to bed at Friday on Friday night at 8.30 because we are this super cool people that we are. We go to bed at 8.30 on a Friday night. Well, first I showered, I blue dried my hair. (laughs) Yeah, which was kind of odd to me. I didn't really put all the pieces of the puzzle together. I'm like, that's weird that she's, it's probably because I was out on the couch watching one of my shows and she's in the bathroom taking a shower and blow drying her hair and getting the to-go bag ready. But I didn't really put all the pieces of the puzzle together. Mm -hmm. So we go to bed at 830 and she wakes me up at 1130. And she goes, so I called the on-call doctor and she said she wants me to come in. They're just going to give me some medication that's going to stop these contractions and we're going to try to make it at least another week. So no need for you to get up. Stay here because Stella's asleep upstairs. Don't worry about it. 
uh, just turn your phone on and I'll let you know what happens. I'm just going to go get a shot and I'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to drive myself to the hospital with my overnight bag. <laughs> so here I am in a in a haze because I'm just waking up from deep REM sleep. I said, really? <laughs> yep. I had never actually gone to bed. So I had continued timing these contractions and eventually made the call that I should call the on-call doctor knowing that I was a scheduled C-section and we will get into it, but it was going to be a complex scheduled C-section, not just an, a normal C-section. Nothing with us is typically normal. So anyways, yes, I, I called the doctor and but again, she's just blowing it off. She's saying, you know, don't worry about it. Just stay here in bed. And, you know, we don't want to wake Stella up. I'm just going to drive myself up there, get a shot, and I'll be back. Just keep your phone on. So I'm like, okay, you know, I, I'm just being a dumb guy, and I don't really think that I should be concerned about anything. <laughs> you did tell me to drive safely because it was late and it was a Friday night. Oh, I did say that. <laughs> I said, okay, it's after midnight on a Friday night. Drive safe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So at 1.30, my phone rings, and she goes, we're going to have a baby at 7.15 this morning. I said, oh, <laughs> okay, that's cool. Hmm. So what time do you want me to be there, babe? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much how it happened. She's like 6, 6.15, or 6, 6.30, 6 6.45, 7. I'm like, okay, all right. <laughs> See you in a little bit, babe. Yeah. So I do. Do we want to go through the whole story, or? Well, not? I think this. It's what we can do now. That's the fun part of the story, and hopefully, there are some people laughing about this. But I would like to get into the quote unquote serious aspect of it. Uh, the part that not many people talk about the challenges that we've gone through to get to this point, because it's just so not talked about. So you were scheduled for a C-section and you, are we going to get into the Von Willow brands thing now? Sure. I think, so Jenny, I, mean, I think, I think if we're going to go through our whole journey, we should maybe backtrack for those who haven't heard the prior parts of our journey and the autoimmune conditions that I have gone through and the fertility struggles that we've had. Is that something that we should go back and recap a little bit for those who haven't listened in the past? Yeah, I think it's good because again, there's, it's so under talked about. It's so taboo that we just need to say it more. I mean, people should not be ashamed. Young ladies should not feel ashamed for the things that they don't have any control over. So let's start yeah. And even, you know, we'll, we'll dive into it, but even for myself, I mean, when we were first going through the infertility process, we didn't talk about it. We didn't talk to anybody about what we were going through, really didn't even tell much to our family of what we were going through. And it was more because it's not talked about enough. A lot of people don't quite understand it. And we didn't want the questions. We didn't want what, what's next or what are you doing or but then when you don't talk about it, you still get the question. So it's it's not necessarily a fun process either way. But I do wish and hope that with our story that it does get talked about more so that people who are more unaware about infertility concerns can become more aware, number one. They can be more supportive. And then those that are going through it know it's you're not alone because it feels like a really, really lonely process when you're actually going through it, but you're not alone. So I do, you know, I, we talked about, should we share our journey? Should we share our story? And we both agreed that I am in a place now where I feel comfortable sharing it. And I do think that it has allowed me to help multiple individuals get through their journey of infertility and be able to have successful pregnancies in our practice. You know, not saying that we specialize in fertility and we're not a IVF doctor. That's it's not us, but because of our journeys and all the research that Jake and I have done, we've been able to help other individuals. So. Yes. 
So to recap a little bit, we've talked about this on a podcast before, but Jake and I got married back in 2015. And shortly after we got married, uh, I made the decision to come off birth control because this was right after I had been very sick in the hospital, right? When I was having a lot of GI issues, I had lost a lot of weight, was going through what they call adrenal fatigue. And through that entire process of being really sick, losing all the weight, being in and out of the hospital, all the stress that we had, that I had been under with PA school, I had not had a menstrual cycle with taking my birth control in several months. And so shortly after we got married, I made the decision to come off of my birth control in hopes that I would get a menstrual cycle back after coming off the medication. Long story short, I didn't. I went years without having a menstrual cycle on my own. And so we started with seeing our regular OB doctor and they put us on different types of medications. We couldn't stimulate a menstrual cycle. Long story short, we ended up at the infertility specialist, the IVF doctor. And we went through testing and testing and testing and testing scans. I had scans of my brain and scans of my abdomen and all sorts of blood work. Jake had all sorts of blood work, all sorts of tests done. And we weren't getting many answers other than something that they call secondary hypothalamic amenorrhea, (laughs) meaning coming from my brain, even though my brain was normal, my brain, the hypothalamus, which is an organ in the brain, was not communicating to the ovaries to stimulate a period. That was the bottom line. (laughs) <laughs> he's laughing because now we can laugh at can it laugh, now but, but it, it didn't give us any answers it's just so nuck and futz how the whole thing plays out because those of you that are listening that have gone through it or are currently going through it you understand that the pressures that are placed on a newlywed female to get pregnant and start a family I mean, it's just insane. I had no idea the pressures that would be placed on us as a family to start cranking out babies. And yeah, it's your your choice on how you receive them. But at the end of the day, you can't hide it when you've got two older sisters that has have successfully had children and all of your friends are having children and you're going through all of these tests F and MRI of your brain to see what's going on with your brain. They're thinking cancer of your brain. And we're sitting here going, what the hell is going on? So the state that it puts your body in is is this fight or flight state. You know, I'm kind of jumping the gun a little bit here. However, it doesn't help the situation at all. It doesn't help the body relax at all. You know, intimacy and childbearing, it's supposed to be a relaxing a state, so to speak. But when you're in this fight or flight phase where you're constantly waiting for the next test, it's like, okay, what's the results of that test? And I'm not just talking about pregnancy tests. I'm talking about real tests. Like what are these medical tests saying? Do I have cancer? Is there something that's explained here? Is it, what is that one that really pisses me off that diagnosis that they tried to give you a symptomatic or a something infertility Unexplained infertility. Unexplained infertility. And I'm going, what the F is going on right now? This is exactly why we started our practice. This is the definition of insanity. This is treating symptoms and not problems. You're telling my wife, who's been a gymnast her whole entire life, perfectly healthy lady her whole entire life, that she now has unexplained infertility? Like, it's just blowing my mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So carry on. (laughs) Yeah. So by this point, we're fast forwarding now two years. I had already been gluten free. We had figured out that majority of my gut issues and my weight loss and my hair loss and my fatigue and my low iron and everything that had been going on was related to a severe gluten sensitivity and turns out that I actually carry both genes for celiac disease as well. So by this point, I was already gluten free. And I started working with Dr. Carolyn Cedarquist. And we, I actually 
disclosed to her what we had been going through. And she's like the smartest lady that I've ever met. So I was really happy to have her on my side and her and I started digging more and more coming from a functional medicine standpoint, as opposed to the Western medicine standpoint that I had been going from with the infertility specialist. And we decided that I should do food sensitivity testing. So I did the food sensitivity testing and it came back showing that I have a sensitivity and an allergy, uh, IgG and IgE to dairy and beef. And so not only was I eating gluten-free, but now I started to cut out dairy. And it was three months after I cut dairy completely out of my diet that I got the first menstrual cycle by myself that I had had in seven years. That just fucking blew my mind. Sorry if there's kids listening to me, but I'm going, that is just nuts. We had gone through every extreme of Western medicine that you could possibly think of from the OBs all the way through the IUI, IUI, the the IVF docs. We did, we did everything except IVF Mm -hmm. and nobody could give us answers. Right. Until she cuts out dairy and then all of a sudden, poof, magic. She doesn't have to take a shot. She doesn't have to take a pill or a medication to get a, a fake placebo menstrual cycle she gets a normal one naturally on her own and that's the process we've been going through for the last two years as i was taking medications and they were watching my follicles grow and then i was taking an injection to have an ovulation to try to get pregnant off of that or and then we tried the iui rounds so i had been stimulating iui for those that you don't intrauterine know intrauterine injection is where they take my sperm and actually inject it into the uterus. The uterus. To try to fertilize an egg. Yeah, so it's the la- essentially the last step before IVF where they actually retrieve an egg and fertilize, fertilize it, it in a lab and mm-hmm. then insert the egg back into the uterus. Correct, yeah. correct. So now, you know, we had been going through these processes where I was injecting and having medications to be able to get a period. And now three months after removing dairy from my diet, I got the first period by myself that I had had in seven years. And so we were then felt some sense of, okay, now we're, now we're getting, yeah, we're, we were encouraged definitely getting somewhere. So as we continue to move forward, you know, this now has been a four year process between the time that we started this journey till the time that we had our first successful pregnancy. Now, I will say in between there, we did get pregnant twice. And the first time we made it to about 16 weeks and we lost that little boy. And then the second time we got pregnant actually from an IUI procedure. So the intrauterine insemination procedure we got pregnant from and had what they call an an embryonic pregnancy. So I actually got pregnant, but there was no embryo in the sac. So no heartbeat essentially. So we lost that baby as well. So those were my first two pregnancies within this four year time span. And then we actually did get pregnant the third time. And that's where Stella June came into the picture. Stella Junebug. Yes. So four years into our journey, four years of doing our own research and working with, you know, a very great mentor that I still have to this day, figuring out gut health. That was the bottom line. One of the most important things that we went through was figuring out the gut health issues that I was having, reducing internal inflammation. And we got pregnant the with Stella. Yeah. And the important part, unimportant part to mention there is we got to the point to where we both agreed that we were just done, absolutely done with the Western medicine IVF doctor. And we were not going to move forward with IVF, not spending 30, 40 grand for you to make me a baby in the lab. You know, I don't have anything against people that do. However, that just went against what we, what I believe as far as treating problems and not symptoms is like, there has to be something that's causing this. If it resorts to this down the road, then okay, let's, let's do it. However, I do not truly believe that we had exhausted all natural pathways and really gave it our all to figure this out. So I said, okay, we both agreed. 
let's just take a break from that doctor. Let's just relax. Let's have fun. Let's go out on our buddy's boat and have some fun Saturdays. And magically, Stella happened. Like, it's just magic. <laughs> and I do work with tons of individuals who do IVF. I'm not, again, like Jake said, I'm, we're not opposed to IVF at all. We work with a lot of individuals that do have to go through that process to be able to have successful pregnancies. But again, even if you're going through that process, it's not a guarantee that you're going to have healthy eggs that they retrieve or that these eggs actually mature and fertilize. Or once they transfer the egg back or the embryo back, once it does fertilize, that it's going to allow for a successful pregnancy. And so even if we're still going through that IVF process, we still have to look at our gut health and our vitamin levels and our thyroid functions and make sure that your body is optimized the best that it can be to be able to grow and develop these follicles and to hold a successful pregnancy. So we've been working with individuals on that, just optimizing their system and reducing as much inflammation as we can to make sure that they equally are as ready to have a successful pregnancy if they do have to go that route of IVF. But obviously, if we can help people avoid it, we try. Right. So at the end of the day, we had spent years and thousands of dollars mm -hmm. going the Western medicine route, trying to seek answers just to get a freaking answer for this infertility and couldn't get anything until we went the functional medicine route. Dr. Cedarquist said, let's do food sensitivity screening and you already cut in gluten out, but then dairy comes back. Beef was also there, but we never really ate a lot of beef. We eat a ton of venison. And that's one thing I told you before you did the <laughs> screening. I said, if this comes back and you're sensitive to venison, this is probably a deal breaker. We might have to cut this off. <laughs> so I'm saying that jokingly, but when dairy came back, it was like, Oh my God, mm -hmm. are you freaking serious? Right. Cut and, dairy out. And tons of nuts. I mean, remember the nut category oh, yeah. on my sensitivity? Yeah. Nuts? yeah. It, it was like almost every nut except for walnuts and macadamia nuts, I think, were the only two out of 18 nuts that were tested on the sensitivity. Yeah, and you were list. like a squirrel. Yeah. I had, I was always having not only nuts, but almond butter and peanut butter and sun butter. And yeah. <laughs> I mean, I love it all. Yeah. So. so anyways, fast forward, we got Stella all by ourselves with the help of Dr. Cedarquist figuring it out. And that's what took us down the functional medicine route. And then fast forward even farther, here's Vera K mm -hmm. sitting in your little kangaroo pouch. So yes. precious. <laughs> yeah. And can we talk about how this was the scheduled C-section? And Sure. Yeah. So we're all excited. We didn't find out if Stella was a boy or a girl, because up to that point, we had been through so much. Both of us agreed. I don't care if it's a boy or a girl. Just give me a healthy baby. And she came out a girl and it's like, the first thing Jenny says is, I don't believe you. Let me see it. <laughs> because it was an emergency C-section. So she's in the operating room and they've got this giant blue tarp in front of us. And I'm sitting back there with Jenny's head, essentially. And they cut the baby out. She says it's a girl. And Jenny's like, I don't believe it. So she lifts it up over the tarp and she goes, oh, my gosh, it's a girl. Mm -hmm. So anyways, fast forward to this next or this Vera Kay's pregnancy. We agreed again. We don't want to find out if it's a boy or a girl because it was just too much excitement. Like it just was the best not knowing what it was. And the whole pregnancy, I really didn't care if it was a boy or a girl. I was still on the same thought process that I would just be blessed to have another healthy baby. I'm okay being a girl dad if it comes down to that. So I don't care if it's a boy or a girl. We had both names picked out. And three weeks before the scheduled C-section, the hematologist, she had to go see hematology because she's got this autoimmune disorder that she was born with that's called it's von... It's actually a genetic disorder. A genetic yeah. disorder that she was born with that's called von Willebrand's disease. And it essentially means that you don't clot fast. So if you get a cut, you just bleed and bleed and bleed and bleed. And they found this when Jenny's mom was cutting her fingernails when she was a month old or something like that. Mm -hmm. And the finger just would not stop bleeding. That's how she found out the diagnosis. So there have been 
a handful of times over our relationship together where we'll be in the woods or something will happen and she'll cut herself and it's like, what the hell? This thing will not stop bleeding. So of course, surgery is a concern. You don't want to bleed out while having surgery. So she had to consult with hematology and the hematologist said that it had to be a scheduled C-section under full anesthesia versus a spinal. And the reason why that's relevant is because of the recovery time is one thing. But second of all, you're asleep. So you don't know when the baby's born. You don't know if it was a boy or a girl. You're completely sedated. You're out. You're not in twilight. You're out. It's surgery. And then you wake up and then you're foggy. So it takes time for you to wake back up again. So we got this news and it was a real kick to the balls because both of us were just really excited. Stella's pregnancy was just a nightmare as far as um, complications go. So it was so stressful the whole time versus Vera Kay's pregnancy, knock on wood. I guess we don't have to knock on wood anymore because mm -hmm. it's done. There was zero issues at all. And we're just going any minute now, something's going to happen and the stress levels are going to go up, but it never happened. Just a normal pregnancy. And then we're so close. We're three weeks away from the scheduled C-section and they tell us, well, you actually can't be awake when they cut this thing out of your stomach. And you and weren't allowed to be in the room. And by the way, dad, you can't even be in the room yeah. because it's an official surgery and you can't be in the room for a surgery. And we're going, what the F is going on here? So anyways, that was a hard pill to swallow, but neither here nor there, just give me a healthy baby. Fast forward. Well, and the other concerns with general anesthesia is that the baby can't have the anesthesia, so it has to be a very quick prompt procedure and no pain medicine can be distributed during the process either because the baby can't have the pain medicine. So no nerve blocks, no pain medicines. Yeah. Just asleep. Yep. So go to <laughs> sleep. They're going to cut you open. And as soon as you wake up, we can give you pain meds. Mm -hmm. So this is where it gets exciting. <laughs> <laughs> so they flay open Jenny's belly, cut Vera K out, take her out get her cleaned up, bring her into the room next door, the waiting room or the recovery room where I'm sitting. I She's wrapped up in a blanket. We both agreed to not put a bow on her head or a blue hat. We would unwrap the baby together once she woke, once Jenny woke back up again so we could find out the sex together. So they bring me this baby. So I'm sitting in this waiting or this recovery room holding this baby going, oh my gosh, it just happened. So I'm sitting there waiting for 20 minutes and then out of nowhere, the door opens, here's a baby. And she walked out <laughs> and then 15 minutes later, they wheeled Jenny in. Jenny's just completely groggy. Her eyes are open. She's awake, but she's not with it. And I'm holding a baby. I'm super excited. Jenny's completely out of it. I'm going, what's going on here? And as she's waking up more and more, she just kept saying, this is excruciating pain. I feel like such a baby. And I didn't put all the pieces of the puzzle together. But the two nurses were trying to figure out the technology to get the pain pump working. And because this was such a rare birthing process, they didn't know how to work the machine. And I in hindsight, I was like, what the hell happened there? And they're like, we do this once a year at the most. It's so rare for somebody to have to go under full anesthesia mm -hmm. to have a C-section. Right. So Jenny's there coming out of anesthesia, no pain meds in her body at all. They just flayed her stomach open. And we're trying to unwrap this baby and enjoy this moment. Mm -hmm. And she's just talk, or focusing on how much pain she's in. And the nurse is over there trying to figure it out. This goes on for over 30 minutes, right. maybe 45 minutes. But again, I didn't realize the severity of it. I didn't put the two pieces together where I'm going, she doesn't have any pain medicine at all. I thought they were just trying to give you more. Right. right. So can you imagine... Waking up, this is like horror story shit where you just wake up in a bathtub and your kidneys are gone. <laughs> but it's like 
they cut you open and you don't have any pain meds at all. And she's laying there. She's not crying, but she's telling me how much pain she's in. This is how much of a badass Jenny is. <laughs> I kept saying, I'm such a wuss, but this hurts so bad. And meanwhile, I, if you haven't had a pregnancy, you wouldn't know this. If you have had a pregnancy, you know what I'm talking about. But every four minutes after you have a baby, they push on your uterus to prevent blood clots and to make sure there's no clotting issues. So not only did they fillet my stomach open, but then they're pushing on my uterus with no nerve block. <laughs> it was it was excruciating. Yeah. You know, if that was me. This is a, there's a reason why guys don't do this. I would be crying and screaming. I would be trying to burn that place <laughs> to the ground. <laughs> But nonetheless, we opened up baby and we found it was a girl. Or she's girl. a girl. Yeah. Vera, Vera K. K. Yep. Yep. And, <laughs> and Jenny still doesn't have pain medicine. And she the first words that she says is, I can't do this again. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, Jenny, let's not worry about doing this again. Let's just enjoy this one. Me being naive again, I didn't know how much pain she was in. I'm like, let's just enjoy this one right now. And she's like, F this one too. Uh, so not every experience is like that. But, you know, we we haven't had a normal birthing, normal pregnancy or birthing process yet. Maybe third time's a charm. But it's, you know, something that we, like we said in the beginning, it just needs to be talked about. It needs to be, we need more people to be aware of the different situations that do occur. So there is support there, there's education there, and there's help for other individuals. Yeah. And the important thing I want people to take away, this is not just about pregnancy. This could be about any diagnosis period. Because think about it, if it wasn't for Dr. Cedarquist coming into our lives, we could have easily, we were on the adoption route. We had given up and we actually had paperwork to start the adoption process, which is not bad either. No, we had already come uh, filled out all the paperwork, submitted it. We were approved and we were just waiting. Yep. So we could have been in the adoption line, not saying that this is better or that's better, but I'm just saying our lives are in a completely different place right now because we didn't listen to Western medicine. That's what I want people to get from this is just from a simple food sensitivity test that we could have easily done seven years prior and saved thousands and thousands of dollars. The test doesn't cost more than a couple hundred dollars. Right, right. And that sensitivity test can change lives in so many different areas, not just fertility, but essential tremors. We've we're seeing that yeah, right one of our now. Mutual guys, right now. It's... Even yours. I mean, you had an essential tremor, yeah. terribly, and that was a food sensitivity issue, gut issues in general, migraines. We're helping individuals with every day with migraines and by doing food sensitivity testing. So, you know that. That one test, you know, people say, well, it's so expensive. It's an investment in your health, but it could change your life. So that's yeah. how I feel about that. So at the end of the day, really what I want a lot of the ladies to understand is there's another way. There's another way. Just because the Western medicine doctor is telling you that you can't get pregnant or you got to take all these drugs. We could have easily went down the IVF road and spent another 30 to 40 grand to make it happen. And we could have had babies most mm -hmm. likely. Mm -hmm. And again, there's nothing wrong with that, but I'm just saying there's another way. Right. Get the freaking food sensitivity screen. Right. Look in, look into your body specifically. So not the treatment that's helping other people, which again, you know, it's okay if that's the route that you, we do have to go, but let's look at your body. Let's look at your blood. Let's look at your vitamin levels and really see if we can figure out the problem, not just treating the symptoms. And now that Vera K is waking up, this is a good time for us to wrap things up. Perfect timing, Vera K. Yeah, good job. Little kissy lips. Oh, little kissy lips. Smoochy, <laughs> smoochy, smooch. 
All right. Well, thanks for listening to that. And if anybody has any questions or, you know, any interest in learning more about themselves, please reach out to us. All of our information is at the end of the podcast, but we're really excited to help other individuals go through a process that seems really daunting and lonely. Love it. Doesn't Absolutely love it. Please share this with somebody. I know that there's some grandmas listening to this, knowing that they got some granddaughters that are dealing with the same thing. So share this podcast with them. Share it. Spread the word. Scream it out loud. You're not alone. Thank you, guys. Ciao for now. Thank you for subscribing on your social media and podcast platforms to the Berman Method. Dr. Jake Berman with Berman Physical Therapy and Jenny Berman, Physician Assistant with Berman Health and Wellness. You can find more information on our website, www.bermanpt.com for physical therapy, bermanpt.com forward slash wellness for the health and wellness. You can also find us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, and on your podcast platform. So be sure to follow us, like us, subscribe to us. And if you would like any further information, definitely visit our website and reach out to us. You may also find our free reports on the websites as well, where you can download this free information for yourself. Have a great day.